Thank you for tuning in to an episode of In Range. This is the September 2020 Q&A. All of these questions are provided by very important and incredible Patreon supporters because In Range is completely viewer supported. We have no sponsors, no overlords, no monetization besides viewer support, direct viewer support. So it's really based on you watching this if you want to keep In Range TV alive. If you're one of those people, thank you very much. Uh, it really is amazing that you've been able to keep this project going and allow us to do the kind of work that we do here honest and unrepresented by any corporation besides us and you supporting us. If you'd like to consider it, you can find us at patreon.com slash inrange TV. And if you can't, just watch the video and share with your friends. But thank you for watching either way. Let's go ahead and get going with the questions. Ryan R. I've heard you mention that you think that the 4570 is a bad cartridge. Can you elaborate on that opinion? Um, I, I don't remember ever saying that 4570 was a bad cartridge, nor do I remember saying that 4570 was a difficult cartridge to reload. Um, in fact, it's one of the easier cartridges to reload because it is a straight-walled cartridge. Um, the difficulty with 4570 is that you, I believe, you need a single-stage press and you need to lube the cartridges so that they don't get stuck in the resizing portion. Um, now, 4570 is, you know, an artifact of its time. It's got a very rainbow-like trajectory, and so you have to really know your range estimation and really understand your gun to be able to get good hits past, say, 200 yards. But that said, it's certainly viable to very great distances. People shoot 4570 out to 1,200 yards. You just got to know what you're doing. Um, I don't think 4570 is a bad cartridge. Um, I don't know where that comes from. I think maybe it came from me saying that it was a little bit difficult to reload if you didn't use a single stage press. Maybe? I'm not sure. Craig S. Advice for people considering their first nods. Well, I would ask you, what are you going to use it for? Um, that's the most important part of this. Those are an expensive investment. And what is your application for? Are you going to go wildlife viewing? Are you in a place where you could hunt with them, which is not common, but possible? Um, do you want to wander in the darkness with it because it's fun to see the world through those eyes? That's certainly one option. Or are you looking for the tactical application? Um, if you're looking for the simplicity of just seeing wildlife and enjoying uh, what happens at night without having white light applied to it, um, you can go pretty low cost. You can go Gen 2 and get a lot out of that. If you're looking for tactical applications, you need to be able to identify what's human, what's not, how far away, and if realistically you'd want to be able to identify not only that it's a human, but who it is. And that starts getting into the expensive Gen 3 or higher category. Um, I will also advise you that um, walking around in nods, especially if you're going with a PVS7 type monocular one that covers both eyes, you're going to lose your, lose your depth perception. And uh, it's possible to do, and I can do it. You can drive with them on, but you've got to get used to it. Um, the other option, of course, is a single eye unit, like a PVS-14, at which point your other eye uses ambient light, if there is any, and the night vision enhanced eye to be able to give you still a sense of 3D perception, typically you put over your non-dominant eye. Um, so, I don't know. I'd have to get more information from you, Craig, about what your goals are with the nods. So... Um, I would say that uh, you need to figure out what your purpose is and what you're trying to achieve and then determine from there uh, what, uh, how much expense you're willing to put into such an investment. I will tell you this, that um, once you buy them, I have found that kind of like NFA items, you get a machine gun, you use it a little bit, maybe you use it a lot of bit, but you don't use it all the time and you use it very sparingly. And night vision is the same way. You spend a lot of money on it and you don't really use it that much. So keep that in mind. Tom K, do you still play Onward or VR in general? Why or why not? Um, I do use VR intermittently. I don't use VR as much as I used to. I've been really busy with trying to keep video stuff going and keeping in range going and all the things that go on with, with, with doing the work that I do. Um, do I still use VR? I absolutely do. Um, the, the VR game that I played last that I really enjoyed a lot and, and, and just got sucked into was um, uh, The Walking Dead Saints and Sinners. That was awesome. As for v Onward, I haven't played Onward in quite a while, to be honest. Um, I think Onward's great. I'm not saying there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with Onward. I just haven't put the time into it lately. Um, uh, it's still a great game. Uh, it's still a great sim, and it's a great combat sim. Um, so there's no real reason why not in terms of it being VR or Onward. It's just been where I've been placing my time. James P., would you do a mud test on an 1886 or slash 1892 lever gun? Yeah. You know, I get these questions all the time. Would you do a mud test on? I will do a mud test on anything as long as I get my hands on it. I don't happen to have an 1886 or 1892 in my inventory because I don't particularly 
care for the 1886 or 92 action. So I haven't bought one um, for my purposes yet. Perhaps I need to buy one for the reference collection to do a mud test on, and I think I will. Uh, I just haven't got there yet. But would I do one, a mud test on either one of those? Absolutely. Charles S. Fifth time asking. Sorry, Charles. What is your take on the Army's new submachine gun? Well, I know why this is the fifth time asking, and I apologize for this. I don't really have a take on it. I haven't shot that particular gun. Um, I haven't used that particular gun, so therefore I have no handling or insight I can give you in terms of what it's like to use that particular submachine gun. Um, what I can say is that I think that we uh, abandoned the submachine gun inappropriately in certain roles, and I think the submachine gun certainly has applications still in the world, and I think you're seeing that being the case with the Army adopting a new submachine gun. Now, it's limited in its roles. The, uh, the submachine gun can't do everything, and that's the reason we saw this, like, you know, this is the case with all firearms, design, development, and selection processes. You give up one thing to get another, and you can get very specialized guns that do very specialized things, and you can get generalized guns that do generalized things, and of course, the very specialized guns do the very specialized thing very well, but they don't do general application well, and the generalized guns don't do special applications very well. And um, the submachine gun, in my opinion, is generally speaking, I know that this will cause some consternation, a better choice than a shotgun, but it fulfills a similar role to the shotgun, but it enables you to reach out further and also suppress better. So I, 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 it also has the benefit of being less blast, sturm und drang, for lack of a better term, inside structures, and et cetera. And when you suppress a submachine gun, they can be very, very quiet. So I think there are niche applications to submachine guns that are not gone yet in the world. And I can understand why they'd still want one in the inventory, even if it is for very specific roles and applications. Ulim, odd AR-15 calibers, which one interests you the most? I'm sorry to answer you with another boring answer here, but none of them. I don't care. Um, to me, the AR-15 uh, lives and dies in 5.56. It doesn't die in 5.56, but for me, the AR-15 is a 5.56 gun, and I don't have any reason to have an AR-15 outside of 5.56. 300 Blackout does compelling things. I will be uh, willing to admit that. But 300 Blackout also brings liabilities to the table that I don't even want to deal with. So um, I guess if I had to pick one, and I know this is controversial because I have been negative about 300 Blackout reliably, and I still will be in many ways, but I guess 300 Blackout in terms of it's getting an adaptation in the world and it's somewhat easy availability would be the next best choice. TH. I am... I'm partially red-green colorblind. Do they make blue dot sights? You know, they do, but I've never seen one from what I would call a high-end manufacturer. They're all kind of on the lower end. I think the highest-end one I've seen is from Burris. And Burris makes good stuff. I'm not saying that's bad. I haven't used this particular sight. But when you look up blue dot sight, most of them are NC star and stuff that's absolutely unacceptable. Uh, but Burris does make one, and so I would advise you to look at Burris. Um, I have done some work with green dot sights, and I got to tell you, for me personally, I find red's the way to go, but I also am not colorblind. So, but the answer is yes, they do make blue dot sights, and Harris makes one. So, excuse me, Burris. So I would, I would Google Burris blue dot sight, and you'll probably find it. Jeremy the Head Fox. Which firearm accessory that you really, really, really wanted ended up being the biggest letdown once you got your hands on it? This one was easy for me. The Loophole Devo. Um, that optic, which has this really intriguing concept of being prismatic, being offset to the side of the gun, getting out of the way, giving you more rail space, all the things that the Lupo Devo seems to provide, um, uh, failed in every possible way. It, um, it had a very bad eye box. It had a hard time zeroing. It actually failed on me twice. I had two of them fail and sent back to the manufacturer and repaired. And at that point, I gave up on the Loophole Devo. I never landed up getting good footage with it and never did a review of it. But you might as well consider this my review. Um, yeah, I was really excited about the Devo. I thought it had a compelling argument. And then when I actually got it, I despised it and had problems with it. Psycho Flight. Would you consider an Old West vignette on Bass Reeves? Yeah, of course, absolutely. Uh, he's on the radar, and he's going to be on the list. And um, there's the Old West vignettes that I want to do are kind of infinite, and I do them very intermittently. They don't, like I said, they don't get lots of views. Um, however, I like doing them, and will continue doing them because I think they're worth doing and important, and also give us perspective into our modern world in a way we don't get by not looking at history. Um, and Bass Reeves is definitely one of them, and he's a very amazing person in terms of the Old West. And if you in the audience are not familiar with him, I would, I would advise you to Google him. But um, him and um, 
and uh, Mickey Free are two that present a very interesting perspective into the marginalized corners of what was the Old West. Um, and uh, I think those are both really interesting people that will both present interesting topics in that regard. There's others, of course. Those are not the only two. But those two come to mind as two right there that are representative in a way that are um, very interesting. So, yes, I do plan to do one. Christian S. PS5 or Xbox or PC? What is your preference for gaming? Uh, my, my preference is always PC. PC every time if I can get away with it. Um, I happen to have a PS4. And I'm currently, um, since you asked if, I'm, if I do play video games, I don't play lots of video games. Currently kind of sucked into Wasteland 3. I've always been a fan of the Wasteland series, Wasteland 1, way back when in the 80s. Wasteland 2 was good. Wasteland 3 is even better than Wasteland 2. And I, I put that one up on the PS4, interestingly. And I did that because I wanted to be able to sit on my couch and just use a controller. And I, didn't, I don't feel like I lost anything in that particular gaming experience by going with a PS4. Um, first person shooters and flight sims and stuff on control on consoles to me are an absolute waste of time and that's where I prefer PC uh, but there are times with like the uh, with Wasteland 3 for example that I find the uh, consoles to be fine uh, but if I had my druthers or only have to choose one it would be PC every time John W advice on deciding between all different precision rifle brands where do you think the point of diminishing returns is Tika versus Savage, et cetera. Well, gosh, you know, that's only something you can answer to yourself. What is it you're trying to do with these precision rifles? Um, I will tell you that I have an old, and I mean old now, 15-year-old, maybe longer, um, Savage 10 FP XP LEA, 308 gun. And that gun with the right ammo will shoot sub-half MOA all day long, all the time. It's a big, heavy beast. It's not modern by any stretch of the imagination, but with good glass and good ammo, that's a 1,200-yard gun, no problem, any time. So, and that's a relatively cheap precision rifle. Uh, it really depends on what you're looking for, and I think the diminishing turns happen. The diminishment of your return happens quite quickly as you go up in cost. Tikas are obviously freaking fabulous, but I got to tell you, if I were to say where is the where is the the um, the magic point? Where is the where do all the corners come together to make the right price for the quality for the precision? And I keep being impressed with the Ruger Precision Rifle. Um, the RPR is phenomenal, and I don't think you could go very wrong with an RPR in 6.5 Creedmoor. In fact, with Precision Rifles, you should spend less on the rifle and more on the glass. Cody C. Do you carry an everyday carry knife? Nope. Um, I do not. Um, I carry like a little utility knife in my wallet for the purposes of opening packages and boxes and stuff like that, but I don't carry any like readily accessible flip open knife. And... Um, the reason for that came about through taking uh, South Narc's ECQC course, the Extreme Close Quarters Combat. And it became, if you take that class, or you take any like very realistically oriented close quarters self-defense course, all the doodads and things hanging off your body um, are things you need to defend against being used against you in that type of a tussle. And um, guess what? Knives are really easy to get pulled out of your pocket, flipped open, and used on you. So um, I do not really believe in a readily accessible, easily accessible like knife or combat knife or utility knife sitting on my belt or in my pocket. And I don't want to have to defend a knife and a concealed carry pistol at the same time from someone if they're on me. So nope, I do not carry an EDC knife. Autism gaming. And autism is spelled A-W-E-T-I-S-M, which is a pretty cool play on words. Is it possible to make an SKS into a DMR? It goes on a little bit. Uh, why? Um, it's possible to make anything into a DMR, right? I mean, DMR is, is more application than actual design. Now, you can design rifles specifically to be designated marksman rifles, and they're going to be more applicable to that role. And could you put a piece of glass and accurize an SKS to make it a DMR? Yeah. But why are you doing that to an SKS? Um, it's not the platform designed for that in any possible stretch of the imagination. And I would say that you could do any kind of, like, sneaky shit you wanted to do with a DMR-type gun within the SKS's cartridge parameters out to 300 yards, probably with the irons. So, um, yeah, you could turn anything into a DMR, but, 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 but why? Really, but why? Thomas P. 
I see the backup gun match is popular. What about a two gun match with just shotgun and backup gun? Wow, interesting you asked that. We've done that before and there's actually footage on InRange TV of that very scenario. And in fact, at the two gun action challenge, or at two gun action .squarespace .com, we have a rule set specifically for matches that are shotgun pistol only. I haven't done it in quite a while. However, we're going to be doing that this October at the uh, Pima Pistol Club match here near Tucson. It's going to be a shotgun pistol match with some kind of a Halloween theme. And uh, it will be, um, that will be really fun and interesting. The rule set that way we run shotguns and pistols, very different than any other uh, timed based event. Um, you can use buckshot slugs or birdshot or your pistol. You have to empty your shotgun or have a major malfunction before you transition to your pistol. But when the shotgun runs dry or throughout the course of fire, you can decide to keep reloading your shotgun or transition to your pistol when it's empty. And that's a much more realistic, practical application of the shotgun. And that's how we run our shotgun pistol matches. There will be footage from that match in October, so stay tuned. Josh W. Is the Ouija board from the S333 video new, or is it just something you had lying around for a while? Kind of a mixture of both. I bought that knowing I wanted to do a Ouija board joke on the channel for a long time. So it's been sitting around waiting for the right opportunity to use it. And it just came to me that that was the right video to do it in, and boom, there it showed up. So it has been laying around for a while, but it's new in that it was purchased for the purposes of using it as a prop on the channel. Hunter T, second time asking. Carl, how does the Desert DPM combat shirt I've seen you wear in some recent match footage compare to other shirts you've worn in the Arizona heat for matches? All of these combat shirts um, are nice and cool on the chest and hot on the sleeves. So you, they're breathe, they breathe in the middle and they don't breathe on your arms. So um, I would say that it's kind of warm compared to a just desert dweller wicking shirt cooling thing, but it also provides you some protection on your arms. Uh, by the way, the Varus Vileka stuff's fantastic, and they have a little bit better in terms of the cooling vents and things you can do with their stuff. But once again, the sleeves are still hot while you cool in the middle. So if you have to wear a combat blouse, uh, these combat shirts that wick in the middle and don't have wicking for sleeves are a good middle ground. But if you're in the super hot environment that we are, a Dedicated purpose cooling shirt is still better. Phoenix A. You've answered a couple questions about your music choices, but what was the best concert that you have attended thus far? I've had a few that really stick out to me. Um, the one that pops in my brain was, God, a year ago. It was before the pandemic. Maybe it was two years ago. It was two years ago. It was two years ago. Who knows anymore, right? Is there time? Do we live in time? Two years ago. Uh, Chelsea Wolf, who's a gothic, kind of gothy, noise, industrial, folk mix artist. Uh, her most recent album is more on the folky side, goth folk, and it's absolutely stunningly excellent. And um, she played here in Tucson in a very small venue, and it was right here, and the whole band was on stage. It was incredibly well decorated, um, on point, and, th and themed well. And she put on a really powerful presentation and a very powerful uh, performance. I think that would be my favorite. Stuka444, do you have experience making Civil War 58 caliber paper cartridges and do you have tips for making them? Yes, I do. I have experience making Civil War cartridges, uh, 58 caliber Meunier cartridges, buckshot cartridges, uh, revolver paper cartridges for Civil War revolvers, and more of that will be coming to the channel. However, it won't be coming to YouTube. I've got some stuff coming and I've done some work and what I'm going to do when this happens is there'll be a video on YouTube with a brief introduction, some basic information, but if you want to see the actual nuts and bolts, the guts of it, you're going to have to go to one of my other distribution points, whether it's Recoil TV, BitChute, um, I'm working on Utreon, that's, that's in progress, uh, Facebook as well, um, any one of those will have the full version uncensored and YouTube will have a censored version. So um, you're, the first time you're going to see that is the third week of October, by the way. Uh, but I am, I've been holding back on doing certain types of content, and I'm really frustrated by it because it's the kind of content I want to do, and the stupid YouTube policies are having a cooling effect on what I'm creating, and that's nonsense. And I'm not going to do that. Now, the problem is I know that I'm going to have super-duper diminishing returns on views doing this but I don't care. I have Patreon supporters and hopefully you guys will stick with me and will watch the uncensored content on other distribution channels as I push them there. So yes, I will. I do have knowledge doing that and will be creating content about it. 
Greg S. Would the 300 Blackout be a good all-round cal caliber for two-gun ACM and similar type of matches? Uh, it's worse than 5.56, has more recoil, more expensive to shoot. There's absolutely no reason not to use 5.56 at a two-gun match, quite honestly. Um, any other cartridge is something niche, and it's something you want to play with, and that's fine. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but the reality is um, if you're not shooting simple 5.56, you're wasting money and time. Not time, money and effort. Um, you may not be wasting time because it may be what you want to do. Winchester 94, what did you shoot in cowboy action class and equipment? Uh, yeah, okay, so some of you may know or may not know, I shot cowboy action shooting here in Arizona for many years. Um, I was the second place state champion in my division a couple of years in a row, which was Frontier Cartridge Duelist. Frontier Cartridge Duelist requires black powder across all of your guns, and I shot open top 1871s, chambered in 45 Special, I shot an 1866 Winchester um, that was in regular, uh, that actually had the uh, 45 special adapter in it. Um, and I shot side by side hammered uh, Pioneer Greener Coach Gun. And um, that was what I shot. So Frontier Cartridge Duelist, 45 caliber, 45 special, but it could have shot 45 Colt. 1871's a brace of them. One had a 7.5 inch barrel, one had a 5 inch barrel. Um, and uh, I still have those guns. And a 66 with a cowboy, a 45 special uh, lifter, and a Pioneer work, Gunworks greener side by side 12 gauge. He adds to the question on a separate note, in the next Desert Brutality, could you shoot Gunfighter in the manual category with a set of top brakes? Gunfighter, by the way, is when you have two handguns out at the same time, akimbo, and you know, alternate between targets. Um, if you are qualified to do that, contact me when the match is up and listed, and we will discuss it. Tyler A. Henry's come out with their Long Ranger in 6.5 Creedmoor. I didn't know this. I assume this is a Henry lever gun in 6.5. With your experience shooting uh, the 1873 in Desert Brutality, would you say, if all other things are equal, a lever action can perform similarly to a bolt action rifle in a real shooting environment, prone, different positions, maintaining a sight picture? I will argue that a lever action, if it's smooth enough um, with good sights, will perform better than a bolt action rifle in prone, different shooting positions, and maintaining a sight picture. Now, 6.5 Creedmoor is going to have a lot more recoil than what I was shooting, which was a, a 45 Colt gun, or 44 for that matter, indistinguishable in terms of recoil impulse. Um, but if you've got a smooth gun and got good re recoil control, you're going to have a better time maintaining a higher rate of fire, sight picture, and all those things with a lever gun than a bolt gun. I think lever guns are underappreciated um, worldwide. And prone, you just turn the gun, doop, and then go. It's not a problem. I don't know where that lore comes from. So, yes, I would. Do I know anything about the Long Ranger from Henry? I know nothing about it. Nothing at all. Jordan W. Second submission. The particularly mature and thoughtful videos of the last couple months convinced me to give InRange my first Patreon patronage. Thank you so much, Jordan. Which leads me to ask, is Patreon the best place to support the channel? Yeah, it honestly it is. Um, now, I'm trying to diversify that, and I'm working on something with Utreon. I may be doing something with Floatplane. Those are not things yet. They, they're coming, or may be coming. Utreon is coming. Flow pain may be coming. But here's the deal. Uh, sending in contributions via PayPal directly works. You can do that. Um, you, can send, you can send a su support to the uh, InRange PO box. But here's what Patreon does that makes it incredibly valuable. It gives you an idea of what's coming in each and in every individual month. So you can actually do your budget and allocate resources as you see fit. And it's not this, I don't know what next month's gonna be situation. So it adds one some sanity to the content creator's mind and that they know where they're sitting in terms of what next month looks like. It also provides them the ability to spend the funding appropriately and be able to allocate their funds uh, towards the projects. So Patreon provides something, it's, it's almost like having, if your Patreon stable, which InRanges has been, thankfully, my gosh, thank you so much. Um, Patreon provides something like having a, a standard corporate job in terms of your content creation because you have like a monthly pay cycle. I don't know how to put that any other way. If you're not on Patreon and it's just voluntary basic random donations, uh, you don't know every month's different. And that makes it a very hard thing to do, a very hard project to maintain and a very hard way to live, quite honestly. John G. Is there any piece of older IRTV content that you'd like to revisit? Yes, the very first video we ever did on InRange TV, which was um, observation rounds, uh, B Patron and the Soviet equivalent on 
ballistic gel with um, bone in it, as well as I want to do something against steel plates and look at shrapnel spall and all that. So absolutely, I'd like to revisit B Patron and observation ammo. Hard to do, expensive to get, and someday I will. And it's also a really old in-range video, and my presentation capabilities then, let's just say we're different than they are now. James D. Love the content. Thank you. You've often compared other rifles to ARs. How would you rate an AKM, an AK-74, and G-36 to other rifles you have experience with on a percentage scale compared with the modern AR-15 being the top score? I'm mostly interested in how you rank the AK platform, but here are your thoughts on other rifles. Well, James, I think I've done this intermittently on the channel already, but uh, the AK I've done quite extensively, and there are some videos doing direct comparisons. I would urge you to look for them on the channel. Um, I have consistently found the AKM to be a wonderful platform, the AK-74 to be almost the equivalent of the AR. Ergonomics take about a 10% speed hit over the AR. So uh, the AK gives you, you're about 10% slower consistently with an AK-74 than you are an AR. 760 by 39, of course, ups that a bit because of the recoil impulse. But the, um, the, uh, an AK-74 with a good optic is barely 10% slower than a standard AR-15 for me. Uh, when you say the G36, I would say the G36 would be somewhere around, I think with enough time, the G36 would be just as fast as an AR. I don't think there'd be any difference there. There's a couple little ergonomic changes, but I think you'd be right there. Um, the AK is about 10% slower. Phantom Boomer. You and Ian overlap so much on your programs. Is there an actual connection between in-range and forgotten weapons? Well, yeah, I mean, so... Forgotten Weapons existed before in range, and I invited Ian to come shoot my match because I saw him struggling at another match with some old gun. And that's how we met and became friends and started working together. And then in range spun off as a modern um, interpretation, of, or a, I should say, uh, looking at modern guns and firearms and other things through the lens of history as a, not a spin off, but as an associate with Forgotten Weapons. And of course, Ian is a long term uh, co host on this channel, so there's definitely a connection there. Um, in terms of content sometimes being the same on both channels, or uh, I shouldn't say same, uh, corresponding or correlating to one another, sometimes that's planned and sometimes that's an accident. It's really funny how sometimes it happens by accident. But a lot of the times, if you see like Taser on Forgotten Weapons and Taser on InRange, that's because we, so we worked together to make that happen. Garrett S., do you change your zero based on what optics you use, is, or is it just what you're familiar for holdovers? Uh, no, I change my zeros based on the cartridge I'm shooting and the gun. So 5.56, five, for example, I always zero at 50 yards. I confirm at 200. doesn't matter what it is, unless it's some weirdo historic optic that has, a, has to be a 100-yard zero with a BDC, which I will do then. But if it's any practical optic, like a red dot or anything like that, something I'm not going to be dialing dope into, um, I always zero 50, 200. Uh, 545 the same, 308 I typically zero at 100. It, so it's not based on the optics so much as it's based on the cartridge. Patrick S. What are your thoughts on short stroke kits and lever actions? Are they more useful and are they historically accurate? So for those of you that don't know, a short stroke kit makes it so that when you throw the toggle on a, on a lever gun, like this, I'm not going to run this because it's loaded, but if you run the action, when you run this toggle, Pretty much it goes all the way to here before it actually gets around on the lifter and then closes. Short strokes will make it so you can throw it as much as 25% of that distance and perform all that mechanical action with less distance. It makes the gun faster. It also means you have less mechanical advantage and you have to hit it harder to cycle the gun. This is very common in cowboy action. People do that in cowboy action all the time because it makes the gun faster. Um, and cowboy action is a speed event above all things. Uh, are, so are they useful for speed? Yes. Would I put one in a gun that I want to use for practical applications? No. Would I use one in a cowboy action match? Yes, although I didn't. I preferred leaving my guns alone. I'm one of those people. I'm a purist. And are they historically accurate? No. But as a completely modern invention, there's probably something someone made somewhere in 1878 that I don't know about. But in terms of actually finding a lever gun in 1878, guess what? None of them had a short stroke kit. Short stroke kits are a modern invention for cowboy action shooting. Cutler R, single ply or double ply TP? Double ply, what, who, who uses single ply? We live in a society, man. Seth G, second time asking, how much of a time handicap in competition is a single stack pistol with a heel magazine catch? Significant. Uh, the single stack is a huge problem in terms of um, capacity. Capacity matters a lot. 
capacity matters the most. But the uh, heel release is also slow because you can't just drop the mag with your firing hand and then pull a mag out of your kit to reload. You have to use this and frequently you have to hit it with, you have to use two hands, which diminishes the time or increases the time it takes to get another magazine off of your belt and into the gun. Single stack, bad for speed. Heel release, bad for speed. Combined, super bad for speed. Michael M. Can you expand on the caliber conversions for the MDR? Based on what I've seen, it appears you need to zero every optic when you change calibers. Yes, you do. You absolutely do. Um, when you change calibers, you have to change your zero changes with it. You change the barrel, but you don't change the upper receiver that has the Picatinny rail on it. So what you could do is have an optic that allows you to modify dope. And when you modify the dope, it would, uh, you could say, for example, the 308, you turn, you add five clicks elevation and three clicks windage or something like that. If you have some optic like that, that would be good. A Mi Pro Lite that allows you to modify the zero based on what gun it's on would be perfect for that. By the way, there is a video coming on InRange about that. It's a great site. Um, but yes, every time you change the caliber, you have to at least adjust your optic to the zero. Absolutely. John B. Do you have any interest in doing some historical content from the Prohibition era in the Southwest? Absolutely do, um, absolutely will, and absolutely have. Um, if you find the video about um, Gleason, Arizona, type in G-L-E-E-S-O-N, you will find that there's actually some content about Prohibition there and Sheriff Wheeler back here in Arizona when Arizona was a dry state and New Mexico was not, and Mexico was not. So there's some already, but there's gonna be more, and I'll eventually get to it. Uh, but yes, I will do some Prohibition era content. Rob R. Have you ever considered doing an affordable updated night vision video? Not really, uh, maybe someday. It's not on the, it's not really high on my agenda right now. Brendan S. Since it was so cool to see you run the 1862 Colt at the match, would you consider designing a two gun H ACM match to accommodate cowboy action guns? But you know, it's funny. Um, I used to, before I ran two-gun action challenge match, I actually tried to run something called Western three-gun, which is shooting on the move, more dynamic, practical shooting with cowboy guns in Tombstone. And it was fun, it was so fun. Here's the problem. The people that own cowboy guns don't want to shoot that kind of match, and the people that want to shoot the kind of match two-gun action is typically don't own cowboy guns. The demographics don't cross. Um, I have run cowboy stuff at two-gun before, and I love doing it, and I would love to have more cowboy type or Old West equipment represented at Two Gun Action Challenge Match. It's always an option to do that. We have a manual division that's already there for that purpose. And the reality is it doesn't ever happen. I think I'm one of the, I'm, I may be, I, there's one other shooter that will do it occasionally. Kevin, you know who you are. But outside of Kevin and myself, no one else does this. No one. So I would love to do it. I would love to have a practical Two Gun Action Cowboy match. I don't think it's viable. Alex P. When you were shooting high power rifle, did you have a dry fire practice routine for offhand and how did you do it? Yes, I did. Um, so I would take a piece of paper and draw a tiny little black dot on it and tape it on the wall at a distance that represented the same size from perception as the target we're shooting at at 200 yards offhand. Offhand is standing, by the way. Then of course, no magazine and clear the gun. And there is actually a tool you can get that allows you to reset the hammer easier but you can just run the action with no magazine in it. And then you get up, put all of your bondage gear on, and sit there and go, click, and read your sights every time you drop the hammer. Run the action, do it again. It really did help with high power. Um, it's not fun though, it's kind of boring. Matthew J. How would you employ a 1911 during the American Revolution to get the most out of its advantages? Um, I would just use it. Um, a 1911 on the battlefield of the American Revolutionary War during the time period where everyone used using Kentucky rifles and smoothbores would dominate the battlefield. You could have one 1911 with a couple mags and you'd be a force to be reckoned with. Um, just having it alone would be enough. You wouldn't even have to consider deployment uh, scenarios. A couple of them would be ridiculous. Remember, the smoothbores typically were only effective at 50 yards and in except in volley fire. And at that point, you can start raining fire with a 45. And it, 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 would be, it would be horrendous. The 1911 alone would change the battlefield. Phase, second time around. Do you think a red dot pistol sight where the main glass folds flat for easier concealability would be a practical design? Or is there some reason it wouldn't work? I think this is an incredible idea and I don't know why we don't see this happening more often. Um, NC Star of all people makes one. And it's, uh, I won't trust anything NC Star makes so I can't use that. I don't understand why we haven't seen one come from a core quality manufacturer. 
I think it's an interesting concept. I think it's a design that should be um, experimented with, and I would like to see someone do it appropriately. Nate, do you ever look at other audience-funded content producers to get ideas about what content you can take advantage of your funding model? Nope. I don't. I don't really watch really much other content, especially not gun-related content. I watch some con I do watch other content on YouTube, but it's not usually gun stuff. It's usually history stuff or like urbex or something like that. So no, I honestly don't. William H. Am I a unicorn? I'm a liberal gun owner. I'm told that is not possible, and I have been called very colorful names by other gun owners. I'm not just an owner, but a collector, from black powder to modern sporting rifles, and I don't see anything incongruent with being a gun owner. I, have no, I don't believe any politician is my friend. What will it take for the gun community to accept alternative gun owners? Um, I think that there's a lot of people like that out there in the world, and I know a lot of them, William. And uh, I think we're seeing an uptick of people on that other side of the political spectrum acquiring firearms and understanding uh, the importance of them um, as a right and a tradition and for self-defense. Um, what will it take? Uh, it will take more of the uh, voices in the community, the media, and us as individuals to be more accepting and tolerant of anyone that believes in our rights, regardless of other differences we may have, because rights are universal. And... Um, should be universal and should be treated as universal. And being someone that has a somewhat different political view than a lot of what is seen as the monoculture political beliefs of the gun community is a difficult uphill travel. Not because necessarily you are a unicorn, because you are not. It is because the monolithic media culture and the people that have grabbed onto the gun community and are um, holding onto it with a death grip for cultural reasons rather than the reasons of rights for all um, seem to want to make you think otherwise, but they're wrong. And all I can say is, uh, yeah, you're going to get called names. I get it all the time just for having uh, the ability or willingness to speak opinions that are divergent from the uh, hive mind. Um, anytime you go against the hive mind, you will find people who will be against you and will try to tear you down. But they're who's wrong, not you, because you have the right to your opinions and you have the right to speak your mind and you have a right to not be part of a monoculture. Eric S., has there been any whispers of a winter brutality match? There have been whispers of a Finnish winter brutality match next year in 2021. Stay tuned. Yuri R. What are your thoughts on using a suppressor with the What Would Stoner Do 2020 rifle? I think it's absolutely fine. And the, the muzzle device we will have on the as-delivered What Would Stoner Do rifle will be fine. You'll have standard threading on there so you could put a threaded suppressor on or change the flash dive or the muzzle device to fit whatever suppressor you have. Or if you have like a halo or something, you could use the A2 style flash rider we're going to provide. It does have a pencil barrel, and suppressors do cause uh, zero shift, not only a suppressor, unless you get a very high-end expensive one, but also putting weight on the end of the barrel can cause zero shift. That does not mean that it's not repeatable. If you know what you're doing with the suppressor and you cause it to be repeatable, or you use an optic that allows you to adjust the dope for what you've done, so for example, I know that I happen to put on, I need to put on three minutes elevation when I put my suppressor on the gun, there's no reason that it won't work on a what was done to your rifle, and when we have the complete rifle here, not one that's close, but complete, complete, I'm going to do a video about that um, with a couple different optics, or at least one different optic, and my Halo, which is a giant heavy beast. And I'll prove that it's completely viable. Scott V. In your excellent Old West vignette series, thank you. I don't recall you talking about any one Old West, old West outlaw you would have liked to have met. Is there one? Yes. Um, if I were to pick any of these people that I would want to meet, the one that, that, that well, there's two. Um, God, I have to give you two. Uh, honestly, Billy the Kid. Um, he has been denigrated as a criminal and an outlaw, but in my opinion, he was mostly someone fighting against uh, government tyranny and um, corrupt law enforcement who were allied with a corporation and killed his friends. I think he would be an interesting and very intelligent person to speak to, and I would like to be able to talk to him about his perspective rather than read about them. And the other one is someone named Mickey Free. Not necessarily an outlaw, but a very, a very interesting person here in Arizona that crossed cultural boundaries and lived a very rugged, hard life. Um, and I haven't done a video about him, but Will, uh, he's fascinating. Matt J., I would love to see your library. Would you mind giving us a peek? I wouldn't mind showing you what's in my library, but I would mind showing you my library because it's utter chaos. It is not organized. It is all sorts of stuff, and lots of it. I have a lot of books um, scattered amongst multiple bookshelves across multiple rooms. So maybe someday if I get to the actually organizing it, but at the moment, it looks bad. <laughs> it doesn't look bad, but it's just not organized. So yeah, maybe someday. 
Ulim, again, or maybe a different Ulim. What trigger is in your what stone or do? Um, the same one that was in the 2017 is going to be in the 2020. It's the SLT1 from KE Arms. If you haven't seen the video about the SLT triggers from KE Arms and why we chose it, um, it is not because of a relationship with KE Arms. It's because we believe it to be the best trigger. So that video is on the channel from the 2017 project, and it won't change for 2020. Thomas K. Any interest in making a What Would Stoner Do 2020 California edition? Uh, we looked into it, and it was too much trouble right now, to be honest. Depending on the success of the What Would Stoner Do 2020 rifle in its current iteration, we may be able to explore California models, but um, there was going to be some work with the mold to make it California compliant, to make it capable of being easily California compliant, and that didn't work with the mold process, didn't flow right. So physics worked against you in that regard, California. Will we investigate it someday? Maybe. Is there interest right now? No, there isn't. I'm sorry. Hey, guys, uh, thank you so much. These are all the questions for this month. Thank you for keeping In Range TV alive with your Patreon support. It really is humbling and amazing that uh, so many people come together to keep this channel funded when I have no monetization from advertisers or corporations or anyone. Strictly you, the viewer, and it's the purest form of a relationship that a content creator can have with its viewer base and that you keep the channel alive if you want it to be alive. If you guys decide you don't want InRange anymore and stop supporting it, InRange goes away. If you want to continue to support InRange or add on to the support for InRange, InRange gets bigger and hopefully badder. Um, badder as in doing better content. Thank you so much for all of you that are doing that. If you aren't already, please consider it. And once again, even if you can't, just subscribe to one of the multiple distribution points. You can find them all at inrange.tv watch and share with your friends. Thanks a lot.